Welcome back to The Y. I'm Todd Baker Prakyan in our Chicago studios. This half hour, we're looking into how screens affect our brains. So much of what we do every day requires some type of electronic device. And these days, even infants are looking at screens as they learn about the world. We wanted to look into what all that screen time does to the brain. Tyler Atkinson did some digging for us. It's typically the first thing you grab when you wake up and the last thing you use before going to bed, your smartphone, a device that revolutionized our interactions, placing a full-fledged computing device in our pockets. Research shows Americans check their phones 96 times a day. That's once every 10 minutes. Combine that smartphone usage with laptops and television, and in 2022, the average U.S. adult will spend more than eight hours a day staring at a screen. That means the average U.S. adult spends more time watching a screen during the day than they sleep every night. According to Vision Direct, the average person will spend the equivalent of 44 years of their life staring at screens. Higher levels of exposure to digital technology has created a set of symptoms called digital eye strain. Nearly 60% of Americans experience some symptoms of digital eye strain. The blue light emitted from computers, smartphones, tablets, televisions, and other electronic devices has led to health concerns of blue light exposure to eye tissues. Because blue light has a short wavelength, it produces a high amount of energy. According to UAB Medicine, too much blue light exposure could damage some sensitive cells in the retina and can lead to focusing problems and eye strain. But no research has conclusively shown blue light causes long-term harm, eye disease, or retina damage. Still, that doesn't mean hours of screen time is healthy. Digital eye strain can put extra burden on eye focus muscles and can lead to dry eyes. For children, it's even worse. Since the pandemic, children have been spending almost triple the recommended amount of screen time. Research shows that on average, children had nearly six hours of screen time a day, some even longer at a staggering 13 hours a day. Screen time was even higher for children of color and lower income families than white wealthier kids. A JAMA pediatric study shows for teenagers, screen time outside of virtual school doubled from pre-pandemic levels, from nearly 3.8 hours per day to 7.7 .7 hours each day. That's because kids are more exposed to digital electronics at an earlier age. Nearly half of all children eight and under have their own tablet device and spend an average of about 2.25 hours a day on digital screens. Research shows children who spent more than two hours a day on screen time activities scored lower on language and thinking tests. And some children with more than seven hours a day of screen time experience thinning of the brain's cortex, an area of the brain related to critical thinking and reasoning. It's also impacting their sleep, which is crucial for little ones as a good night's sleep is essential for brain development. The blue light from screens inhibits melatonin, which can delay sleep. Watching TV or playing games also keeps kids' bodies and brains more alert and less ready for sleep. For teens who stay up late texting, not only are they not getting enough rest for their eyes, they are getting less REM sleep, which is needed for processing and storing information from that day into memory. And with that, thanks for spending a few minutes of screen time with us. Let's bring in Dr. Michael Rich. He's a pediatrician at Boston Children's Hospital and also the founder and director of the Digital Wellness Lab. It's the first medical program that focuses on all social and mental health issues related to technology. Thanks for coming on The Y tonight. Let's start with the basics. When you're in front of a screen, especially for hours at a time, what is happening to our brain? Um, well, I think that first of all, we should take a step back and get wor stop worrying so much about the screen itself as to what we are doing with the screen and what we are not doing because we're on a screen. The reality is, is that we're moving into a world now that is more and more screen dependent for education, for work, for communication, for social life. Um, and so what we need to do is be more mindful in our use of these screens and more balanced in how much we use the screens and how much we have off screen time. Um, we've spent a lot of time sort of obsessing and worrying about increased screen time, which is really something that is an artifact held over from the days when television was the only screen we had, and it was used only for entertainment. 
Now we have to be more thoughtful and directed in our use of screens and also more thoughtful and directed in our turning off of screens rather than using them as a default behavior. So let me ask you this, like I'll use myself as an example here. If I'm sitting in front of a screen for hours at a time for my job, very close, I start getting headaches. Is that typical? Like what are some of those impacts that we're seeing on the brain physically by being in front of a screen like that? Um, well, it takes a lot of cognitive resources actually to translate this two-dimensional pattern of light darkness and color, mm -hmm. which is what a screen is, into an analog of the real world. And so one of the things that's happening is you're tiring. Your cognitive circuits, your visual circuits are tiring to a certain degree. And one of the things you can do is literally just take a break, look off into the distance, help your eyes reset, uh, take a walk. Um, I think also just sitting still causes headaches and causes, you know, physical fatigue. And so it's really about, again, balancing what we're doing on screen and understanding that we should be doing other things as well to refresh our body and mind. So kids these days, even toddlers and infants have toys now where they're learning numbers and letters. It's all on a screen. There's games on iPads that are educational, but Look, we had flashcards growing up. It's now all on a screen. What impact does that have on the developing brain? Well, I think there's some interesting positives and negatives of it. First of all, um, I, I do think that, um, again, a screen takes more translation than a book. Uh, a book actually is something that is usually more often shared. Um, in the sense of you're sitting in mama's lap and, and reading the book with her, whereas mom is maybe more likely to hand you that iPad and, and have you, you know, run with it yourself because it will speak to you. It will do all the things that she imagines she's doing. But the reality is that laps are better than apps. And it's a way to connect in a whole lot of different ways than just learning letters and numbers. Are there screens that are better than others. We hear a lot about the kinds of light that are used on the screens. Are there some that you would consider healthier? Um, when it comes to certain things, um, the, the reality is these screens emit a very blue light, an early morning light. And we as diurnal animals interpret that as alert, get to work, you know, go out and, and live your day. And then at the end of the day, when the sun goes down, uh, when we're under incandescent lighting and it's darker, um, we get more drowsy because our body is secreting melatonin. What that blue light does is it suppresses melatonin secretion. And so one of the things that uh, is, is problematic is watching a screen or looking at a screen even to read right up until the moment when we need to go to sleep. And it gets delayed for that reason. What have you noticed about how screen time affects social skills, especially for kids and teenagers? Um, a, a number of ways. First of all, that we believe, particularly when we have some social anxiety or shyness or, you know, awkwardness, um, we believe that it's a safer place to interact with people, that it's a place where you're not going to be feel as awkward or feel as embarrassed, et cetera. Um, and yet we expect to get the same kind of deep and meaningful connection that we get from real life connections. But so in some ways we are using these screens not to connect so much as to protect us from that awkwardness, um, et cetera. The second thing is often a lot of social media is asynchronous. Um, and so you put something out there and you don't get an immediate response the way you do when you have a conversation with someone um, where you get to see, oh, my, I said something that I thought was a joke, but it hurt their feelings. Mm -hmm. And you can respond in real time. Um, and so oftentimes things will get misinterpreted and spiral out of control in a way with that. Um, not to mention the whole effect of, you know, people feeling um, sort of invulnerable in this online sort of anonymous space and so they tend to be edgier meaner um and you know try to push things harder um as well as they expect to get the kind of love back so if they sh show a picture of themselves with their new outfit 
and they get negative response to it or worse yet, no response to it, um, and worst of all, get ghosted, um, they will, you know, uh, really take that personally, whereas it really would not happen in a physical interaction with someone. The pandemic really made us all spend a lot more time in front of a screen from Zoom meetings to virtual school. JAMA Pediatrics did a study that showed screen time outside of virtual school doubled from pre-pandemic levels from nearly 3.8 hours a day to 7.7 hours each day. I mean, that's just extraordinary. Is that healthy? Um. Well, no, I mean, it's not healthy simply that, you know, when you're in school for six hours and you're in front of a screen for another 7.7 .7 hours, mm -hmm. that is more than half of your 24 hour day sitting still in front of a screen. So it's not good for you physically. It's not good for your eyes. And for a whole lot of reasons, it's not good for you psychologically and emotionally. Um, now, the flip side of that, of course, is that um, school, um, at least in the full school year that was remote schooling, let's discount the spring of 2020, um, did a relatively good job in most cases of didactic teaching of math, of English, of science. What they didn't address at all effectively is the social emotional learning that goes on in school, which is so essential. What happens in the lunchroom, in the playground, um, in the hallways, where kids are learning to create their own society, where they're learning to get along and communicate and negotiate. Um, and so what happened is that that occurred kind of freestyle in places like Roblox and Minecraft and Fortnite even. And when I talk to kids about these games, they don't talk about the game. They don't talk about winning and lo losing. They talk about hanging out with their friends. And so this became the equivalent of recess, of going to the park and kicking a soccer ball around. I'm really curious to get your perspective on the mental health aspects, especially for teenagers who spend so much of their lives on these social platforms. What do we need to understand as parents and to protect our kids in a world they're growing up in that we didn't? Absolutely. This is this is so essential. And I think the first thing that we've got to understand is um, we're getting nowhere by saying, you know, pointing fingers and saying Instagram is killing our kids or whatever. We have to understand that this is a reality of their world. Not only that, but for them, this is not virtual reality as opposed to physical reality. It's not online versus online, offline life. Um, they move seamlessly between the digital space and the physical space. So for them, it's one environment. Um, I think the second thing is that we have made the mistake, I think, of kind of ignoring what they're doing online in the sense that, oh, they're so much better at it, they're so much more facile with it, that they're in control, they're okay, at least they're not having sex and selling drugs. Um, and instead, we should be with them. We should be treating these power tools as power tools. Um, and just as we don't toss our car keys to a four-year-old and say, have at it, but wait till they're 16 and we sit white knuckled in the front seat while they learn to drive. We need to help them learn to drive these tools in ways that are responsible, respectful of themselves and others, and actually not to even use them until they have a demonstrated need for them, as well as your confidence that they can start to learn to use them in these respectful and responsible ways. Mm -hmm. That's important insight. Dr. Michael Rich, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you.